all. Uh, it's always nice to be the first speaker. You know, by the end of the day, everyone is saturated with a lot of knowledge, and so it's nice to see everyone bright and early. So, uh, the topic which was given to me was uh, reducing maternal mortality, the Indian perspective. And uh, this was in a session on PPH prevention. So it really set me thinking as to, you know, what should I speak on, what should my presentation be, because really reducing maternal mortality, especially in the Indian perspective, is, is like really, uh, really a, a huge topic, which perhaps uh, would not be, would, uh, which I would not be able to do justice to. So. Uh, the outline of my presentation uh, is really to give an overview on the maternal mortality in India and uh, focus a little on the PPH and then try how the program health goals for India uh, and to see what in terms of what our 10th, uh, 12th plan goals are and the MDG goals are. So if we see the maternal mortality rate, we have made an improvement but still not reached what our international and national goals for the maternal mortality are. Uh, and now we move on to the SDGs, uh, where we, there is a, a goal for a further reduction in maternal mortality rate. Uh, and also, uh, there is now focus on universal access to sexual reproductive health, family planning, and also newer indicators which have come. So really, efforts will have to be mounted more on trying to reduce the maternal deaths. Uh, the maternal death, if you see in the last decade in India, uh, the, the maternal death was really high and we have, we have made progress as I said uh, and currently it's 167 but which is 2011-13 data and uh, now in 2015 where really we do not have the figures but we expect that it would be around 140 but still it is much higher than what is required in the MDG which is the, uh, the figure of 109. Uh, as compared to the global context, where there has been a 44% decline in the in uh, maternal mortality rate globally, in India there has been uh, a decline of 68.7%, and that is also because our figures actually were very high, and so uh, you know we really needed to bring down those figures, uh, uh, and so there there has been a, a decline. But some would say that the decline in maternal mortality has been uneven, it's been unequitable and perhaps unsatisfactory also. Because if you see uh, in, in our, uh, some of our northern states, uh, especially the uh, states which are, we are known as the EAG and states, it is still very high, it's 257. And it's only in the southern states uh, where uh, the maternal mortality rate has really gone down. So India is such a diverse country with not only social cultural differences, but also diverse in its healthcare, uh, in its healthcare indices, uh, in the country. So uh, the causes of maternal death, um, these again are very old. This is from 2001 to 2003. Uh, these are the causes of maternal death. And uh, uh, after that, we really do not have national figures on what the causes of maternal death are, but perhaps they are still the same. And postpartum hemorrhage, we know, is the major cause of maternal death in India. And as we've been hearing since yesterday, the causes haven't changed, the interventions haven't changed. It's basically how uh, we are able to implement these inter interventions in the peripheral areas is really going, is what is going to make a difference. Uh, Tamil Nadu, as I said, which is one of our southern states and one of our better states where the health systems is concerned and where the major causes of maternal death are available. And if you see, PPH is still 22.2%. So really, as I said, causes have really not changed for maternal mortality. And if you see it <coughs> through the years, this is nearly a data from a decade. All the years, the, the maternal mortality uh, 
is, is all the same. So very little change in the causes of uh, death and especially in the proportion of the PPH deaths. The factors which affect the MMR, and all of us really know about it, is that there is low access to health facilities and poor quality of health services, um, delivery by unskilled attendants, low socioeconomic status. So it's not only the health system's causes, you know, there are other causes which are also impact the maternal mortality, and especially low status of woman, early age marriage, low family planning. So it's all these factors which really would affect the maternal mortality. And uh, if you see the roadmap to reduction in maternal, mortality, uh, maternal deaths and really some of the proximal and the distal determinants, um, so it's for, for life-threatening complications, you really need access to care, high-risk pregnancy, they could be community-based maternity services, for the high fertility family planning services, and for some of the distal determinants, it's really raising the status of women. So we, we do talk in terms of the three delays, uh, which is in deciding to seek medical care, in reaching medical facility, and in receiving quality care, uh, care. But there is also a major delay in being able to recognize complications. And so it's very critical that these complications are recognized and acted upon to save a woman's life. Uh, this was a study done by the World Bank in uh, 2004 where they really uh, wanted to see which are the interventions which had a ma maximum impact on the maternal deaths averted. And it's really improved access to comprehensive essential obstetric care which really made the maximum difference. And if you see for PPH, it's for prevention, active management of the third stage of labor, and when the PPH occurs, improved access to essential obstetric care, which has really made the difference. The, the health program in India was, especially for uh, maternal care, was de dependent on traditional birth attendance. Most of the women were uh, had home deliveries, but uh, based on evidence, um, the program shifted to skilled birth attendant at childbirth. And uh, I, I'm not going to go into what a skilled birth attendant did, which is, of course, all of you know. But it was this shift in the program to the skilled birth attendant which really made a difference. Uh, and the evidence which came out from both the developed world where institutional deliveries really brought down a reduction in the maternal mortality and which showed that when there was a midwife-assisted delivery, there was a reduction in the maternal mortality rate. And the evidence which came out from the developing countries, especially a small country like Sri Lanka, which showed that expansion of midwifery skills and also increased number of institutional deliveries and deliveries by trained birth attendants brought down the maternal mortality rate. And it was, as you can see, there's a marked reduction in the maternal, the maternal mortality when 85% of the births were attended by a trained personnel. And the higher the proportion of deliveries which is attended by a skilled attendant, we know the lower is the country's MMR. So based on this evidence which was available, the program shifted to a focus on institutional delivery and they were really schemes like the, the JSY and the JSSK which were conditional cash transfer schemes which really incentivized the women to go in for institutional deliveries and this was the real change which brought, came about in the program uh, and this as you can see is from 2005 and then there has been a steady increase in the institutional deliveries. So if you see the percentage of births attended by these skilled birth attendants, there has been a gradual increase over the years. And of course, the goal is to have 100% of the deliveries uh, attended by skilled birth attendants. And we're still, uh, we're still a little far away from achieving that goal. But efforts are ongoing uh, to have these 100% uh, of the institutional deliveries. Now, coming a little focus on prevention of PPH, and we know what works well for, pre uh, for prevention of PPH. We know we have the evidence uh, uh, that uh, active management of the third stage of labor works. We know that there is need for ready availability of blood, that there should be a referral system uh, 
which could take a woman to a higher level of health facility in case a complication occurs and also whether if there are communication linkages through mobile phones um, especially of these um, the, you know colored user groups um, where you know in, in case help is required it can be accessed so uh, we carried out a study on the feasibility of using mesoprostol at the peripheral level for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage. And this was around the time also evidence was coming out from uh, Dr. Derman and Dr. Kotkani's group that mesoprostol uh, led to reduction in postpartum hemorrhage. And uh, this study was a cluster randomized trial which we did in 30 primary health centers where in the intervention we, uh, PHCs we gave tablet uh, mesoprostol. And in the non-intervention PHCs, there was whatever the existing practice was in the program. And we found that there was a significant reduction in the amount of blood loss and in the duration of the third stage of labor. But what I really want to highlight is, if you see in the comparison PHCs at that time, uh, most of the mothers, that is in more than 85%, uh, what they were getting was injection ergometrin. So in, in that, that time, it was, which was in about 2004, 2005, it was really injection ergometrin, which was um, uh, the uterotonic, which was given to mothers. But if you come down to this study again, which was carried out in 2011 by PARC, again, which was done in the community level at two districts in Karnataka and two districts in uh, Uttar Pradesh, if you still see, there is still very high usage of injection um, ergometrin. So even though uh, we do recommend that oxytocin is the drug of choice, still to a very large extent in the peripheral areas, ergometrin is being used. And in this study, the active management of the third stage of labor following whatever the Indian guidelines were there at that time was less than 10% in all the districts. And uh, storage of uterotonics at room temperature was very common. So, <clears throat> uh, if you, and this was the storage condition in the pharmacies where um, a large number were of the oxytocin was stored at room temperature and so was the methyl ergometrin and the methyl ergometrin was also exposed to light. So really there are questions about what the potency of these uterotonics was. Um, we then subsequently did a study on trying to see um, uh, uh, whether the, what uh, the government of India has these evidence-based um, uh, these guidelines and we wanted to see the, pra the provider practices to really see whether the providers were following the guidelines which had been made by the government of India and this study was a prospective cross-sectional survey and was also carried out um, in five districts of the country and in this uh, nearly 1500 deliveries were observed uh, during labor and up to four hours after delivery at medical colleges, district hospitals, FRUs and PHCs. So at all levels of care, we observed what the, uh, the providers were doing. And to our utter dismay, we found that partogram plotting at medical colleges, FRUs and PHCs was only around 20%. At district hospitals, it was non-existent. Uh, hand hygiene, which is a simple intervention which is known to reduce sepsis in the mother and in the newborn, again, was very, very low. And especially when you come to active management of the third stage of labor, at all levels of care, if you would see all components of active management, it was very low and checking for postpartum bleeding was only in about half to one third of the women. So, so really provider practices were really not what they should be. Um, after the new evidence which has come out, uh, we know that now the most important thing for PPH is, uh, is giving a uterotonic. And what we used to do earlier, which was control cord traction and uh, a uterine massage is not considered now. So um, the, the, the program has now moved on to community-based distribution of mesoprostol and that's mainly because there are high rates of home delivery. And if you see some of the states, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, still the northern belt, still very high rates of uh, home deliveries 
many of them, again, which are not conducted by a skilled birth attendant. Uh, and this is, is data from Jharkhand, which is one of our states, where home births not attended by skilled birth attendants were nearly half. Uh, and so there was no, uh, no uterotonic given in these, uh, in these home deliveries. So the rationale for this policy de decision was mainly because um, mesoprostol does not require skills, which we all know of administrating the injection or refrigeration, and WHO has amended its uh, list of essential medicines, and also it has given guidelines that use of mesoprostol by a lay worker can be done. There is global evidence on the effectiveness of advanced distribution of mesoprostol, and also there was local experience on the basis of a pilot study done in Charkand. And so uh, detailed guidelines have been developed by the government in the program for this advanced distribution of mesoprostol, where ANMs were distributed in the eighth month of pregnancy. And in case the ANM is not able to do it, then the ASHA can do it. And uh, also all the other uh, guidelines as to um, you know how it has to be taken, who has to give it, when it has to be given, what is the counseling, all those details have been done. And uh, then coming to, um, uh, so while rolling out this community-based distribution, so initially it was done in a couple of states and now it's being rolled out to other parts where there is, uh, especially in the districts where there is a high number of home deliveries. And so the skill development of the a for this, uh, they have, they, this is through the state level skill labs and through some other programs of the government known as the Dakshata training programs and also through national level skill labs. Uh, and uh, so the way forward, as I said, was first piloting it in two to three districts and then scaling up. And also to the, the, the state level operational plans have been, uh, are being developed. As you know, in India, health is a state subject. So though the center can only advise the states and give the guidelines, the actual implementation is in the provinces and each province has its own way of, uh, of implementation. So the, the, for the PPH reduction, it's now more of a comprehensive PPH reduction approach where it also includes educating the woman on birth planning, complication readiness, the promotion of antenatal care and encouragement to facility birth with, strict, uh, with the skilled birth attendant. And also now government has introduced the, the birth companion scheme also. Uh, and at the facility, it's of course the correct management of labor, routine administration of a uterotonic, and then seeing that there is availability of the uterotonic and the quality is there and uh, postpartum vigilance And for the home births, especially education about the PPH detection uh, and, uh, and education about its usage. Uh, yesterday, there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, it was mentioned that a major uh, problem in the peripheral area is that the health providers are not available. And so really we need to think about effective ways of task shifting. And so the government under its National Rural Health Mission has uh, employed Ayush providers. And Ayush providers are from the Indian Systems of Medicine. And these, they also have a training which is equivalent to a, those of the modern system of medicine, but, in the sense that they get a training of five years and so they are provided SBA training and then they are posted at some of the places where the health providers are not available. So at the behest of the government we carried out this study to see whether uh, these Ayush providers which have been trained whether they are able to provide the SBA services and we found that they uh, these SBA providers are a, a, res a resource which, uh, which, can, uh, which are an important resource, uh, which would be able to fill the gap of uh, health providers. Uh, they have good 
avail uh, good acceptability in the rural areas and they have good presence in the rural areas also and uh, just their skill enhancement and providing them an enabling environment would lead to their successful integration uh, to uh, as a provider into the health system and all the recommendations which were given by us in the sense that they should be given uh, increased skill training and or and uh, you know um, they should be have they should have pre service training in service training all the recommendations which were given out of the study have been accepted by the government of india and ayush providers uh, are being used now as skill birth attendants so we know the maternal health services we know the active referral linkages and what has really worked is this 108 emergency uh, in which it is there is a gps to locate the caller and the ambulance uh, will reach uh, within about 20 to 25 minutes to take the woman to a higher level of health facility and uh, for the blood community based blood donation camps in villages are also being organized so what else works well prevention of anemia and the government has now got the anemia plus initiative and also in some places is trying to introduce the injection of the iron sucrose especially when women do not eat the iron tablet uh, the NS nasg use has uh, we know about that the community based maternity services through anms reduction of higher order births uh, which is also to prevent pph and insights from death audits so maternal death audits have been started uh, they have not been implemented completely all over the country but the operational guidelines have been prepared and uh, all the states are being encouraged to carry out these death audits because a lot can be learned from them The National Iron Plus Initiative, as I mentioned, the program has now moved to the RM and CH Plus A, which is reproductive, maternal, newborn, child health plus adolescent. So this is the whole continuum of care. And earlier it was only in pregnant and lactating women and children, but now it's also in adolescents and in women who are receiving contraceptive. Uh, this was a study which was done by Pathfinder International in four, four uh, states in India and in some of the states where Pathfinder has donated the uh, this uh, this uh, the NASG um, they uh, they are using it but uh, government is still in the process of thinking how it can really uh, further you uh, you know in uh, use this in the program. So coming to what needs to be improved. universal use of partograph to prevent prolonged labors rational use of oxytocin and mesoprostol because we've seen that there is a, a lot of oxytocin and mesoprostol which is being used for augmentation of labor and for uh, uh, induction of labor and a lot of it which is not perhaps required care immediately after delivery we know how important that is mock drills to assess the preparedness of the system improving the ANM training and we did hear about a midwifery cadre and if that can come up it would really be able to address a lot of uh, uh, the issues you know related to the the labor because obviously this cadre would be more trained to be able to recognize and to manage the complications um a study which we did showed that the partograph was as i said earlier i'd shown you hardly being used and because providers lack the skills to plot it they feel it consumes a lot of time a lot of times there's non availability of the partograph sheet and so really partograph is really something which has not taken up so uh, icmr along with the iit has developed a software application using a tablet or a mobile and it can use the smartphone technology which would record the partograph and we call it the prasav graph and in this the real time data would be entered into the partograph uh, into this and this can also be transmitted to a central area where it, you know guidance can be provided to the health provider and this in this also uh it tells the provider as what needs to be done next and so through a very iterative process this has been developed and uh, it has been pilot tested in two hospitals one in delhi one in chandigarh and also among staff nurses and field testing is ongoing in madhya pradesh currently uh skill stations and skill development labs which is so critical to develop the skills and for which again all guidelines have been developed by the government and the other policy decisions to improve the maternal health uh, which are now uh, being implemented is calcium supplementation 
screening during pregnancy for gestational diabetes, hypothyroidism, congenital syphilis, deworming during pregnancy for anemia, and breast and cervical cancer screening. And the most important is repositioning family planning as an MNH initiative. It's no longer for population reduction. It's now as an MNH initiative, and two new contraceptives have been added into the program. One is the inject injectable contraceptive, uh, which is uh, uh, DNPA, and also the progesterone-only pill for pill for lactating mothers. So the basket of choices will now increase. But coming to the most important thing, which is the quality of care, which is such a multi-dimensional thing, and we've heard about it yesterday also, and today, until the, until the quality of care does not improve, we will not going to have any further reduction in maternal mortality, because I think whatever uh, gains we have had because of the high institutional delivery and because of the skilled birth attendance, they will only reach a point, and after that, there are other factors which really need to work on it. And uh, uh, ICMR is really committed to do further work on quality of care and we had asked uh, uh, for proposals uh, we had put on a call for proposals where currently the proposals which we have received are ongoing are uh, undergoing review and in the next couple of years our focus of research is going to be on improving the quality of care and, and this was just something which I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, this was a national priority research setting which was carried out by ICMR, India Clan and Chindri. And uh, yesterday Metan had spoken about the Chindri approach which is uh, considered a fair, transparent and it's considered a very systematic approach. And these are the first three uh, research priorities which were identified in maternal health. Improving EMOC services, and to assess blood transfusion needs and effective de delivery of evidence-based care protocols and algorithms for prevention and management of PPH. So out of the first three research priorities to address PPH, which is, shows how important PPH still is, and out of the 20 research priorities which got the maximum scores, uh, nearly 70% were addressing delivery science. Discovery science was really very little, so really the focus is on delivery. So uh, I would say the way forward is strengthening quality care with appropriate referral linkages. I think this is the most critical element. And scale up of evidence-based interventions, you know, scale up of the use of MagSelf. And I haven't really touched on eclampsia because that would be a whole, you know, different talk completely. And uh, but many of the interventions which the government has now taken would address all the other complications also. Uh, meaningful engagement. We have a very vibrant private sector. You know, uh, uh, we have. Uh, a huge number of health providers in the vibrant sector and how they their strengths can be harnessed and they can be included into providing care i think that is also very important um, and for provider training, perhaps what we're doing up till now is not right because uh, despite repeated trainings when we go and see the practices, you know, they still not do what should be done. So maybe we need to think in terms of innovative ways of provider training, uh, effective task shifting would make a lot of difference and then behavioral change communication, in increased synergy between program implementers and researchers. So there's a lot of knowledge coming out of research, but how that, you know, we need to sit synthesize that knowledge and present it to the uh, policy and program implementers so that it can be incorporated into policy and program. And in the same way, policy and program implementers need to tell researchers what their problems are so that researchers can help them out. So this, this I think, is also very important. And then, of course, implementation and translational research. And for this, at the Council, especially a division has been created on innovation and translational research. So the focus for ICMR uh, in the future is going to be on this also and lastly that you know <coughs> access to all these things like skilled attendance emergency obstetric care and all what I mentioned is absolutely essential but reduction of MMR goes beyond health and it requires a multi-sectoral approach where you know all the sectors the development partners the development sectors work together so whether it's it's the safe water it's sanitation it's education it's gender equality uh, every sector will have to work with the health sector to bring down the maternal deaths so there is there has to be intersectoral coordination and I would like to thank you very much